Good evening, everybody, and um, thank you once again for joining us um, for our presentation evening. Um, this evening's presentation, as I'm sure you all know, um, is on South Africa, and it's being presented by Helen Bryan, our lovely Helen Bryan. Um, lots of us on board this evening, um, and as usual, for those of you who've been on the presentations in the past, we would uh, kindly request that you keep your um, uh, your sound muted and your um, video off. Um, thank you very much. Again, um, hopefully we won't have any uh, IT issues, but um, if we do, please bear with us and we will do whatever we can to um, uh, resolve these during the course of the presentation. But uh, with any luck, we won't have any issues, but um, you never know. Um, We've got a lot of people on uh, the Zoom uh, call this evening, the Zoom presentation this evening. Um, a number of you we know have been on these um, talks and presentations in the past. Um, and uh, thank you very, very much for that. We uh, very much appreciate um, your time. Um, but we also know that a number of you haven't been on the Zoom calls before. So um, for those of you that haven't been on Zoom calls before, um, and that don't know this, um, uh, Wildlife Worldwide began in 1992, um, designing bespoke holidays to various parts of Africa on account of the fact that I had um, led trips and guided in Zambia. Um, we then expanded out into Asia, the Americas um, and the polar regions, and in addition now to offering a whole um, a range of tailor-made wildlife holidays, of course, we're now offering groups um, to various places around the world as well. In fact, pretty much everywhere where there is wonderful wildlife. But I suspect you all know that. Um, but if you don't, you do now. Um, so uh, that is the Wildlife Worldwide advert. A um, couple of other things I want to say just before we um, get started. Um, Firstly, please do make use of the chat facility. One or two of you have already started using it um, this evening, which is really super. Um, the chat comes to me directly. Um, I will see the chat, um, but um, please feel free to uh, post any questions that you would like um, me to put to Helen. Um, and I can do that uh, at the end of the talk. There'll be 10 or 15 minutes of um, uh, of questions, question and answers. So please feel free to make use of the chat facility to to um, to put forward some questions. Um, the other thing that I would ask you, um, which we did on on Tuesday, um, uh, we we have a, the most fantastic um, series of talks uh, that we've had so far, and and also um, that we have coming up. Um, lots of lovely presentations coming up. But if there's anywhere that you would like us to uh, do presentations about. Um, then please feel free to, um, to drop me um, ideas. Again, you're very welcome to do that on email. You can see my email address um, and Helen's email address on, on your screen now, but um, you're very welcome to, again, to drop me a message on, on chat um, if you'd like to, because um, uh, we're always open to, open to ideas. We, um, we have absolutely no shortage of our own, but sometimes it's quite nice to hear perhaps what you would like to um, see us talk about. And we'll do our best to do to um, uh, to help. Um, so I suspect that for many of you, Helen needs absolutely no introduction at all. Um, Helen Bryan has been with Wildlife Worldwide for some years now. Um, she is the most wonderful consultant, um, supremely knowledgeable, um, and um, for those of you who've heard Helen present in the past. Uh, you will know um, how unbelievably dynamic and passionate and enthusiastic she is um, about the places that she uh, talks about and about the places that she's been. Um, I know she is very, very well traveled. She has traveled all around the world, but uh, just during the course of her time um, with us at Wildlife Worldwide in the last few years, she has um, not only been back to her, to her um, African roots, um, she was a guide in, in, in Africa uh, for some time, in South Africa for some time, but she's also been to Tanzania um, and to Zimbabwe. Um, she spent time um, latterly um, in Guyana, 
um, and also in Baja California and the Pantanal. Um, and uh, she has presented uh, talks on a number of those places as, um, as some of you will, will already be aware. Um, that's all from me for now. Um, I'll, I'll keep an eye on chat. Um, I can I can see one or two uh, really nice ideas about um, presentations that you would like to see us do um, coming up on chat already. That's that's really super. Thank you very very much for that. Um, but with that, um, I will now hand over to Helen, who has magically appeared. Um, and uh, <laughs> Helen, over to you. Okay. Later. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Right, hi everybody. Um, those of you, as Chris just said, that don't know me, um, I'm part of the team at Wildlife Worldwide and I have spent a quarter of my life so far living in Africa. And for anybody who spent time in Africa, quite simply, that is not enough. It's a continent that is addictive. It's a continent that I absolutely love. And I just simply can't wait to be able to get on a plane and get back to the bush where you can hear the sounds, the sights, the smells of simply Africa in all its glory. So um, four of the years that I spent living in Southern Africa were in the Greater Kruger area, which is over on the Mozambique border on the eastern part of South Africa that you can see on the map here. Um, but what I'm going to do this evening is take you through what I consider to be the absolute hidden gems of the country. And when I was living out there, I was usually working six weeks on and then two weeks off or three weeks on and a week off. Either way, as soon as I had my off week, I would generally jump in a car and head off and explore the wonderful country that I had at my fingertips. So South Africa, it occupies 1% of the Earth's surface. And yet it's home to 10% of all known birds, fish, plants, and a whopping 6% of the world's known mammal species. What makes South Africa so biodiverse as a country is by and large its location and also its topography. The central plateau is a raised escarpment that will be home to a number of species that simply wouldn't be able to exist in the more arid savanna parts of the country or in temperate lowlands along the coastline. You've got coming up on the west coast, the cold Benguela current that rises up from Antarctica and continues all the way up the west coast um, up through Namibia. Whereas on the eastern side of the country, the temperature is very much governed by the Agulhas current, which comes down from the Indian Ocean, hitting um, the uh, northeastern parts of the country in KwaZulu-Natal. And these are all sort of parts of the country that I'm going to try and touch on um, in the next uh, 35 minutes. That's a challenge. <laughs> right, so how do I start? Well, I'm gonna start with my last trip. And crikey, it was short, it was 10 days, but it was a belter. And it all started one very, very cold uh, morning in Joburg. I was sitting in the departure terminal at the domestic terminal, and I was about to fly into the Northern Cape in the heart of winter, Fool, but I was so excited. And whilst I was sitting in the park lounge, I had my mammal book open, being the nerd that I am. And the mammal book happened to open on a double page spread that defined the differences between a brown hyena and an art wolf. Now, I was familiar with brown hyena, however, I had never seen art wolf. Within 11 hours, that was all about to change. I was about to embark on the most epic wildlife, wild dog in particular, um, sighting of my life. And the day was topped off with a sighting of my very first Ard wolf, as seen here. Now, these are termite and anteating creatures. They like arid conditions. So I was flying into the Northern Cape and I was going to a magical reserve 
by the name of Swalu. Now, Swalu had long been on my radar. I knew a couple of people who'd been incredibly fortunate to go. And what has really put Swalu on the map is pangolin and also potential for aardvark sightings. Now, any seasoned safari goer or aficionado knows that you've got to add pangolin and aardvark to your list. They are sought after species. And if there's one place in the world that I would send you to for a good chance, I'm not going to guarantee it, but for a good chance of seeing pangolin and aardvark, you're not going to go to a better place than Swalu. So I had 48 hours on this reserve as a taster. And essentially, my first game drive, we'd settled in. It was a glorious winter's day, by which I mean it was just over 20 degrees. It was sunny. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. And my guide said to me, of course, it was my guide, because when you go to Swalu, you have one guide, one tracker, one vehicle, and you do not share them with anyone. This is your safari. You determine when you want to go out into the bush, if you only want to do night drives for your stay, so be it. If you want to go out all day during your stay, so be it. One of the perks of staying at Swalu on a tailor-made basis is that it's your safari and you dictate how and where you go. Now, this is a vast reserve. It's actually the largest private game reserve in South Africa. And my guide said to me, what would you like to see? Obviously, in my mind, Dan, my manager, was going, pangolin, aardvark, pangolin, aardvark, pangolin, aardvark. So what came out of my mouth? Dogs, please. <laughs> now, it's not as simple as just saying what you want and going to get it, but they will try their utmost to find what you're looking for. So off we went into the bush. We left just after lunch and uh, in my own vehicle, I was just enjoying being back in Africa, feeling the sun on my face, feeling the dirt in my nostrils. God, I was happy as Larry. After about 45 minutes of quite happily just going through the bush, enjoying the sightings of giraffe um, and um, you know co community nests of all sorts in, in trees and so on, we came across dogs. Of course we did. It was magic, absolutely magic. So what happened is we stopped the vehicle and my guide said to me, off you pop. And I jumped out the side of the vehicle as soon as you could say boo. And I walked down over a dune into a depression where probably about 15 or so wild dogs were snoozing away the afternoon and I started to walk towards the pan that they were all snoozing around. My guide came up behind me with a rifle and we continued to walk closer to the dogs. And as we did so, three of them got up. They all stared in the same direction. The heads went down, the ears went down and I turned around to my guide and I just started to beam. And we looked at each other, we nodded, they'd seen something. As we started following three of these dogs who were just walking at this point, they started to trot and so did we. So trotting through Kalahari sand dunes, that's not easy, let me tell you that. And before we know it, we've got dogs coming up our right hand side, up our left hand side, dogs coming behind us. And I am now out of breath trying to keep up with the pack. And what they've seen is a warthog, a big male warthog. And as we approached the pack, the warthog was in a very small sand depression and it was sitting on its back haunches, protecting its vulnerable backside. And it was charging at the dogs as they surrounded it in a circle. The dogs were like domestic dogs. They were going down into play pose. They were yapping, they were excited. There was noise, it was just incredible. And I knew that this warthog didn't have a way out. Now, what are, what's gonna follow are a few just to make you aware. 
And essentially, this warthog put up one hell of a fight. Huge kudos to the warthog, but the dogs were just too much. One basically grabbed the warthog's tail in its jaws and ripped it off, meaning that the dog smelt blood. And what followed was an absolute frenzy that I was standing about 10 meters away from, crouched behind a very thin thorn bush, just incredibly privileged to be in the right place at the right time to see a sighting that was just beyond my wildest dreams. All hell broke loose. The dogs were communicating at all times. Their tails were raised. They were clearly a hierarchy within the pack and they literally went for this warthog. It was over very, very quickly, thank goodness for the warthog, but it was incredible to simply be on foot in the middle of nowhere, sharing this experience with no one but my guide and my tracker and the giant African sky. It was immense. Once the initial frenzy was over, the dogs then started to scrap over the entrails. You could see the different personalities in the dogs as they interacted with each other. And then the most remarkable thing happened. The dogs just essentially came and made a circle around me and my guide. And they just flopped in the sand and they just recovered from that huge adrenaline filled hunt. And I could have literally put my hand out and touched these dogs. Obviously I didn't. And they just watched me and I watched them. I was so thankful for being exactly where I was at that time. I don't think it's something I'll ever experience again. It was quite simply phenomenal. Just being in proximity with these creatures, let alone on foot and seeing them, the incredible hunters that they are, literally, they just finished this one warthog. They were flopped all around us for perhaps 10 minutes or so, just catching their breath and relaxing. Three more warthogs trotted across the horizon. I kid you not, the whole pack up and bombed after them and we just let them go. It was quite frankly, incredible sighting. One that I will never, ever, ever get. It was superb. So yes, there were dogs at Swalu. The following morning we went out early and there are a couple of habituated meerkat dens that have been um, worked on by the staff at Swalu don't clamber over you like they do in places like, like um, you know, the Kalahari in Botswana. Um, they keep their distance, but you are able to get remarkably close to them. And being somewhat early in the morning, you need a little stretch in the sun. It's time for a brand new day, a little yawn. And then you literally sit on the ground. They're shaking. It's so cold because obviously they're much, much smaller than you anticipate them being. They're really teeny tiny creatures and they stand facing the sun with their sentries and uh, they literally use the sun um, energy to warm themselves up before they then go about on, on their foraging for the day. So it's quite possible to spend a couple of mornings during a stay at Swalu with these guys and they are so entertaining. They are quite simply fabulous. After that, uh, we left the meerkats and we carried on with our morning drive and we came across pangolin tracks. Woo woo, I could hear Dan's just whoops from the office. And um, we followed what would have been a massive male pangolin. He was a big old boy. We didn't find him, but it didn't matter. The thrill again of being out of the vehicle, being on foot and following the creature through the bush um, was just superb. We started to get a bit peckish, so we decided to return to the lodge for lunch. We're passing Sable, we're passing Rowan, all of these wonderful, arid, loving creatures, because we're in the green Kalahari here. We're not far from the Botswana Namib border, and um, 
This arid area is a mecca for Cape foxes, um, also for pangolin and lava, as we've mentioned. So, the afternoon safari started out uh, with cruising the dunes. You go up one dune, down the other, up one, down the other, and it's it's absolutely glorious. The scenery is incredible and it just goes on for as far as the eye can see. And then we stopped and our tracker said, let's just walk this way a little bit. And we walked this way a little bit. And this shot is really just here to show you how essential Kalahari the scenery is. Or is it? Because this is not just a scenery shot. If you look at the forefront of the picture, it looks like there's a small termite mound at the bottom of that thorn bush. That's not a termite mound, that's an aardvark. And I then spent one hour and 15 minutes again, just me and my guide and my tracker, walking through the bush, following this incredible creature. So normally they're not journal. Um, but in the winter months, it gets so cold at night that nocturnal creatures will often come out in mid-afternoon and will forage until 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night before going back in their burrows to sleep off the cold and wait the next sunny day. This one's quite a skinny one. Um, the area had been in drought. They've had a decent amount of rainfall in the Kalahari in the last couple of weeks. Um, but essentially it didn't matter. This was a phenomenal sighting and to spend 75 minutes following it as it furrowed, different angles of the sun on it and birds following it, the ant birds just basically following in order to pick up the ants and termites that this creature leaves behind. Just marvelous. There's not many places in the world where you can do this. And again, the fact that you're on foot is quite simply marvelous. On the way home, after a wonderful afternoon, we came across bat-eared foxes, one of my personal favourites. I just love them. They're like little gremlins. And, uh, and then the following morning, something altogether different. Yes, it's the rare mammals. It's the aardwolf, the aardvark, the pangolin that has put Swalu on the map. But it does have other creatures that you would want to see on safari. It's not big five because there's no elephant there, but we had an awesome lion sighting on my last morning. And she had been out hunting all evening. We just spent, before the sun came up over the mountains behind us, we'd spent 90 minutes with two sets of cubs that were playing in an old termite mound, frolicking, the red dust going everywhere, and it was simply marvelous. Mum and auntie and whoever else were obviously out hunting. And as we left the cubs, we were going along a track and suddenly we saw this lone female and she was calling. And we were like, okay, okay, she's looking for those cubs. And the cubs were, there were two litters, so different ages, I'd say maybe five or six months and maybe three and four months. And she was calling and she'd obviously left them close to where she is here because she was getting quite agitated that they weren't responding. She kept, we just stopped the engine and she just kept on calling. And then, oh my word, it was incredible. We heard a thunder of uh, footsteps coming towards behind us and literally these cubs were running like the wind desperate to get back to this lioness and the reunion was just melt your heart stuff so the cubs were just plowing into her the head rubbing the tails going across the backs they're just constant touching so tactile and it was just glorious. You could see the joy. The cubs, the younger cubs, immediately went down to suckle, and it was just fabulous. She'd soon had enough, though. After all that lovely reunion, she was like, nah, -uh, I've had enough now. And she basically turned in the other direction, taking the cubs with her. And that was the end of a remarkable stay for me at Swalu. So, in just 48 hours, my word, this property knocked my socks off 
And quite frankly, I can't wait to return. I'm fortunate enough to be returning in June. I'm going to be taking a number of groups there um, for seven night stays each time. Now, if you come with us on one of our group trips, which is South Africa's Rare Mammals in Style, we either have a regular group departure or we also have a dedicated photographic departure that will be led by my colleague Brett Charman, an award-winning photographer. And this is where we stay. We have exclusive use of this property. Now, there are only two lodges on the serve anyway, and it is vast. This is Tarkuni. So staying here, uh, the entranceway, you've got a fire pit, you've got outside dining, you can see just beyond that, you've got the pool. As I walked beyond the pool, there's a small lapper at the back and I swear they were leopard tracks that I saw by that lapper. The accommodation, it's just five rooms. So our group size is 10, including me. So it's small, but we will be here for a seven night stay. We go in June because it's winter and therefore some of our sought after nocturnal species um, will, we hope, be coming out earlier in the day in order to feed. Now, Swallow itself is actually open year round. So we can also offer tailor-made Swalu itineraries on a private basis. This is where I stayed on my last visit. Uh, it's the Moxie, it's absolutely gorgeous. There's only nine accommodation units here. The circular roofs that you can see at the back here, these are the accommodation types. So they're on either side of this lovely communal area. And just in front of the infinity pool there is a small dam. Now, during my stay, we had kudu, we had giraffe, we had dogs coming to drink at the dam. The dogs often just run in front of the lodge. I saw cheetah. It was simply phenomenal. Um, I, I literally think this is one of those special places in the world. They are few and far between. They are phenomenal. This was my room, so you can go to sleep looking up at the topographic map of the reserve, reimagining everything that you've seen during the day. And between game drives, if you choose to do morning and afternoon drives, you just while away the day on your sunbed and at night that becomes a star bed. So quite frankly, why would you ever want to leave? I know I didn't. I had to. Because on my short sharp last trip, after Swalu up in the Northern Cape, I was heading down to Cape Town. Flights operate in and out of Swalu from either Joburg or Cape Town. So it's very easy to combine the two. So when I flew into Cape Town, I had a couple of days there. It's my favorite city in the world. They grow wine there. Have I mentioned that? What's more to love? Um, and what I then did is I hired a car and I drove the three hours along the highway to a wonderful nature reserve called De Hoop. And there are a few different accommodation options in De Hoop. It's a little bit of a hidden gem. It's a secret, um, very well, visited by the domestic market, not so much by the international market. And again, this is open year round. And the property that I stayed at um, was brand new. So it's still, this was only two years ago. And it's called Lekavata, which is essentially a translation of a place of good water. Now you can see I've written there, Wales, July to October. You'll read in different travel guides that June to November, July to October, you've got migrating whales and whales coming into the South African shores in order to carve, particularly your southern rights. You do, however, also have humpbacks along the south coast and brooders whales. And this is where I think South Africa offers something um, that not every other African country can do. The chance to, in one holiday, spend time with the big five and the remarkable multitude of smaller creatures that make up the terrestrial safari. And you can combine this with a marine safari as well. Yes, please. So, Lekavata, just a few images to show you what this place is all about. It is stunning. 
what happens is that you, uh, you're you asked to arrive at La Cavata at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. You can't actually drive into the property. They will give you a car park at which you will be vehicle. Game drive, or game drive vehicle will then essentially come and pick you up, bring you over the crest of this hill and down into the property itself. This is it. It's small. It's completely and utterly eco-friendly. And when you are at this property, you physically cannot see signs of other human activity. You stand on the deck here, you look out 180 degrees over the ocean, and it's just you, which is marvellous. So it's a beach house. It's a beautifully done beach house, and it is all about the ocean views. So dining, the lounge area, the outside decks, every piece of this lodge, including the accommodation, is designed to soak up those ocean views. Not only for the bird life, but also for your marine mammals. So when you're on that deck, you're looking out into crystal clear ocean. You might see dolphins, but for many people, the big draw will be southern right whales. So the key months for whale watching from Lekavata are April, sorry, no, they're not, that's complete rubbish. They are August, September and October. I was there in July. I saw a few whales, but if you're looking for quite a few whales, then you need to coincide your visit with it between August and October. So yeah, the Southern Rights are bringing their babies here to calf, or <laughs> they're calfing their babies here. And as you walk down from the main lodge area and you head onto the beach, we were exploring some of the gullies here and the things, all of your activities from here are done on foot. You'll go out and you'll explore rock pools. The guy here is a chap called Lee that I had. He was an absolute living legend. Um, he knows all there is to know about the Fainboss, the, the botanical side of things, the birds. As we were walking through one of the gullies here after going through on a botanical walk, I turned around to him and I was just like, crikey, this would be epic leopard country. And he said, what do you mean would be? And I looked at him and I just started to grin. And would you believe it? Probably less than a minute later, we got onto the beach and there were three sets of fresh leopard tracks. Oh, crikey, I nearly spontaneously combusted. Where else in Africa, certainly I'm not aware of anywhere else, could you potentially be following leopard spore on a beach? Yowzers, this place is fantastic. If the rock pooling and the leopard tracking walks and the botanical walks are just too much for you, just lie by the pool and just take it all in. It's all about the views, drinks on the beach at sundown. You don't even have to leave your room. Just put your binoculars on and you can just literally whale watch from here. This was my room. Very, very nice indeed. So simply gorgeous. After my couple of nights at Lekavata, I drove back to Cape Town and I avoided the highway this time. There's too many vineyards just off here um, that you can go and explore. But I also saw my first ever blue crane, South Africa's national bird in the wild. They were everywhere. I, I'd lost count of the number of times I stopped the car and got my camera out in order to photograph them. I love these creatures. I then followed the coastal route. I just took a day meandering back, stopping at various beaches, and I just made my way back towards Cape Town. If you wanted to break in Hermanus or in Walker Bay, you have the opportunity to go out and uh, do great white swims, or you can take the inland route, which is to take you through Oats Horn and the Karoo home to multitudes of ostrich farms, wine farms, and you end up coming through Franchuk, literally one of my most favorite places in the world. Did I mention they make wine there? Hmm. So, Cape Town, fabulous city, absolutely fabulous city. And um, I'm going to sort of start moving away from my last trip now. So I was Swalu, Cape Town and Lekavata. What I'm gonna do is just very, very quickly because I'm probably running over time, um, very quickly just take you through a couple of the trips that we can organize for you. 
This one I think is an absolute humdinger. Spring flowers from the Cape to the Kalahari. The Western Cape has quite a different rainfall pattern to the Eastern parts of the country. They get winter rain. So um, essentially spring flowers, it's really around August time every year, you may well be lucky. So we have a group departure every year, starts in the Cape, in the city itself, exploring the um, you know, number of botanic and wildlife opportunities that Cape Town has to offer before heading to Hermanus, because of course you're there in whale season. After that, we head up to the wonderful Cedarburg Mountains, beautiful hiking in this area, botanic, there are leopards, there are caracal in these mountains if you're particularly lucky. Very scenic area indeed. We then take you up to Namakwa National Park for the spring flowers before starting to come inland and making our way towards Orgrubby's Falls. And then finally up to the superb Kalahari Transfrontier Park. So who needs a map when we can actually show you what we're talking about? So starting in Cape Town, we visit Kirsten Bosch Botanical Gardens, brilliant for endemic birds, sugar birds. And we also include uh, Boulders Beach for the African penguin. You will then go to Hermanus for the Southern Rights, as mentioned, and heading north then up through the Cedarberg Mountains into Namakwaland National Park. Now, just look at this. Who wouldn't want to do this trip? I think it's brilliant. So um, in the northern parts of the Cape, it's the only part of South Africa in which you'll find quiver trees, which are more commonly associated with Namibia. But of course, you're not far from the Namib border. I love quiver trees, absolutely adore them. And if you can get that mixture of the wildlife and the botany, crikey, what's not to love? So Hemsbach or Oryx, they're probably my most favorite antelope in the world ever. I love them. Um, incredibly well adapted to their arid um, climbs up in this part of the world. And then you get up to Orgrabi's Falls. Um, I didn't visit at a particularly heavy flow time of year, um, but it was still incredibly impressive. This was somewhere I've wanted to stay for a long time. There is a South African National Parks property directly overlooking the falls, so superb. And then finally, we head up into the Kalahari Trans Frontier Park. I love this park. I haven't explored enough of it. I would love to go back. Just think big skies, red dunes, and wonderfully arid landscapes that look like they couldn't support much life at all, negative. Red hartebeers coming across the dunes. This was my shot of a cheetah. This is our tour leader's shot of a cheetah in the Kalahari. So um, we had a coalition of four birds, unbelievable. We saw lion. Um, the number of raptors that we saw was just insane. But also it's the small mammals. I lost count of the number of honey badgers of African wild cat. Um, honey badgers often associate with pale chanting goshawks. The two work together. Um, and this was literally just taken out of my car window on a small pocket camera, not even with my, you know, SLR. So crimson breasted shrikes, pied barbets, the, the arrow loving birds, um, the Trans Kalahari Frontier Park was superb. So really much concentrated on the Northern Cape um, at this stage. And we've potentially got some more product coming online um, for the Northern Cape as well. So sign up to our e-news and we will keep you posted on that. But this again, just before we leave the Kalahari, wonderful Varosi Galal, just snoozing in a tree. This was again taken with a pocket camera whilst I was driving, just stunning. Not bothered by my um, presence at all. So, Next, just very briefly, for people who haven't been to South Africa before, you might like to join our group trip, the Natural Light South Africa. Parts every September, takes you 
picked up along the garden route. We fly up to Joburg before moving through the panorama route, which will then end up in Kruger National Park with five nights up there. Now I could bore you silly for hours with stories of the greater Kruger area marvellous part of the world. Um, there, if you head north to the very northern parts of Kruger, there is no one up there, Pafuri. It is beautiful and you will have sightings to yourself. The more busy parts of the park tend to be the south and central areas. Go north, just hire a car. It's easy and it's accessible. That's the beauty of South Africa, completely and utterly accessible. Just before I wind up, um, one province that I haven't yet talked about that is an absolute favorite for me is KwaZulu-Natal. Now, if you see Lesotho on the map there and Eswatini, which is formerly Swaziland over on the eastern side of the country, KwaZulu-Natal is essentially the province in between the two. Um, slightly bigger than that, but that's the easiest way to describe it. And um, there are some incredible things to do. Again, you could fill two weeks self-drive in this area. Um, you've got the mighty Drakensberg Mountains. You've got the Royal Natal National Park up in the north that borders Lesotho. You've got the eastern side of Lesotho um, that has got some superb hiking trails and endemics to this area, to the mountains. There's snow up here in the winter. Um, it's home to the second highest waterfall in the world, Chugela Falls. Um, it's just a stunningly beautiful part of the country. And you've got the Isimangaliso wetland system uh, where you go out on river cruises, hanging out with crocs and with hippos and um, egrets and just wonderful water system and all the bird life that goes with that. The cry of Africa, an African fish eagle. You've also got whale watching from this part of the country as well, humpbacks off Richards Bay. Um, so, you know, it's not just confined to the Cape regions, there's literally masses to do. You've got loads of private game reserves in KwaZulu-Natal, so you can combine safari with beach, with mountains, with historical, um, uh, you know, sort of holiday. Um, you've got the Zulu, Anglo-Zulu battlefields up there. There's masses to do and it's just brilliant. And I'm gabbling now, I'm well aware of this. Just briefly, while we're in this part of the world, we've also got Zimanga, wildlife and night sky photography. This is a group trip. It's a dedicated photographic trip um, and it is um, hosted by Sean Weekly, um, who we operate with all over the world. Zamanga is a private game reserve um, in the Umkuzi area um, of KwaZulu-Natal. It's about a three hour drive from Durban that you can see on the coast there. So we fly you via Joburg to Durban and then three hours up into Zimanga. Now Zimanga is a big five reserve, but we are offering this as a photography trip and I'm just going to let the images do the talking. I can't, it's just amazing isn't it? That's absolutely amazing. Can you imagine how chuffed you would be if you got that? Oh crikey, and this is just the start. Hyena is one of my all-time favourite animals. Um, yowzers, leopard, crikey. So Zamanga has got nine different photographic hides. A lot of them are underground and a lot of them use reflective pools. And this enables you to basically sit in the hides, have tuition from Sean and get some incredible angles and photos like we've just seen. Now, you might get buffalo coming down, zebra coming down, you know, you, you, it's, you can have all sorts, but um, they've got all the mounts that you would need there. And they've got reflective pools. So this to me is the sound of Africa, black collar, black collar, black collar. This is a black collared barbet or two black collared barbets. One of my favorite birds on the left here, blue, black, blue wax bill. Sorry, I am gabbling, I'm getting too excited. Um, the seed eaters, they are stunning little birds. They're teeny tiny. They often feed with canaries, with fire finches, with twin spots. Um, and in a reflective pool like this, crikey, the photographic opportunities just go on and on and on. So 
Yeah, essentially, Zimanga is another humdinger. Um, it's a relatively new trip for us, and we hope that it will go out this summer. And um, oh, I just think this is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Right, <laughs> you'll be glad to know we're finally coming towards an end. Um, so there are so many places that I haven't yet talked about. As I said, I could the Kruger area for crikey days. Um, we haven't got anywhere near the Waterberg, which is so accessible, only being a couple of hours north from Joburg. You've got some incredible private game reserves up here and some incredible scenery as well. Um, the garden route I haven't discussed, and I haven't discussed Map and Goodway right up there in the north. Um, it's on the border with Mozambique. Um, no, it's not. It's on the border with Zimbabwe and Botswana. And I'm just going to leave you. Uh, I can't really describe how epic the scenery is up there. So I'm just going to leave you with a picture of me in my ultimate happy place. There were elephants walking beneath us. I could hear all the birds around us. Mapham Goodway is superb and it's a hidden gem, but we're just going to have to do some more of South Africa at another time because there is just so much to see. But hopefully I've just taken you through a few of the more unusual areas that you perhaps aren't so familiar with, like the Garden Route and Kruger. And with that, over to you, Chris. Uh -huh. Um Goodness gracious, thank you very, very much for that, Helen. I'm out of breath. I wasn't even- <laughs> Hi, I need a beer. <laughs> What's going on? Um, uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the most recent uh, chat messages um, I had, uh, which was at 8.20, what time is it now? 8.21, says, um, Helen, please don't stop babbling. It's enthusiastic and inspiring. <laughs> Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> but fact, Susan is absolutely right. Um, it, it is absolutely inspiring. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Couldn't go on for another half hour, could you? That's fantastic. Could have gone on for days, that. literally. <laughs> Careful what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that, there is that. Yeah, of course, we have worked in the office together, haven't we? <laughs> um, hey, uh, so, um, which question do I ask you first? Because there's quite a few. Um, I am going to take you back for the moment to Swalu, if I may. You may. Um, firstly, to tell you how unbelievably envious I am of you. Uh, <laughs> having I was been... very lucky. Yes, yes, I know, I know, I know, I know. I should, it should never have been allowed, basically. <laughs> um, in all the years I've been going to Africa, I think I've probably told you, in all the years I've been going to Africa, I've never seen them in Hard Park. And, um, and I've been going for uh, an embarrassingly large number of years now. I've been going since I was in my early teens, as you know, and I've never seen Aardvark. Um, um, and, and actually, when you were doing your, your, your bit about the Aardvark, um, Linda sent a message um, on chat to say that, um, that when she lived in Kenya, um, the Aardvark used to come into the garden and dig up the potatoes. How cool is that? No way! Into my garden here in Winchester. Wow! Um, isn't that amazing? And of course, you're on foot as well in, in Swalu. That's just wonderful. That, that's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's phenomenal. Um, and um, they, they just pull out the stops, you know, they, they, they really do. They, I mean, again, no one's going to guarantee anything, but it is Pangolin and Aardvark that has put Swalu on the map. Um, yeah. And they do say that if you spend four or five nights there, you have a, a, a relatively good chance. Um, so we're hoping that by spending seven nights there, um, that um, you know that that we can see as much as we can. But to be honest, the thing with Swalu, um, even just just the scenery, just being in that vast landscape is enough. You know, um, it's so like Namibia. Um, in terms of just, it just goes on and on and on. Um, it's 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 marvellous. I mean, you, you know, Dan could probably show you the emails that I sent him each afternoon coming back from safari, and he you know, he was just like, why did I send her there? Why didn't I go? <laughs> well, I think we all thought that when you got back. Um, hey, look, just so so keeping on Swalu for a minute, because um, yeah. we've had a num number of questions about that. Um, first things, I, I mean. I think it's probably worth saying a little bit about how you get to Swalu. 
on that group yes. thing. Can I, can I trouble you just to, to mention that? One or two people have asked that on chat. Um, Absolutely. It's, it's really thing. easy, you know. So um, we fly um, using, you've got BA, Virgin and South African. They all fly on overnight flights, very similar timings, arriving into Joburg the following morning. You'll be picked up airside in Joburg from the international terminal. You'll be taken to a private terminal um, that Swalu use, and then they have their own charter that goes daily from Joburg into Swalu, you'll be there early afternoon, you'll be out on drive, you know, that day. Um, on the way home, it's the same thing, private charter back to Joburg, um, and then you'll be escorted to the international terminal for your overnight flight home. Or, and I think this is a real winner, you can also have a daily charter between Swalu and Cape Town mm -hmm. and vice versa. So, um, you know, Cape Town as a city, uh, I hate saying this because I really actually like Joburg, but Cape Town has a lot going for it in terms of tourist attraction. Um, yeah. So if you would rather just avoid Joburg altogether, fly to Cape Town and you can get the daily private charter up to Swallow and back. Brilliant. Excellent. Excellent. I actually did it from Uppington. I flew into Uppington and hired a car so I could go up into the Trans Frontier Park. So I, mm. it, on a tailor-made, you could do this. And then it's a four hour drive to Swalu. So you can also do it that way. And it's very nice driving in Africa, isn't it? As we know, yeah. you know big and yeah. quiet and the directions are very straightforward and so on. Yeah. And they're driving. Last week I used to hire a car. Yeah. And just me on my own. No worries whatsoever. So um so sticking with Swalu again for a minute, um two 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 other sort of um pertinent questions I, I would say. Uh, excuse me for not looking at screen, I was just reading um the questions that have come in. Um, uh, one is, um, tell us about, about the, uh, just can you say a little bit more about the climate there when you're there and, and also um, with reference to that um, uh, insects and, you know, mosquitoes and, and that sort of thing, those, you know, it would be quite good perhaps to elaborate on that for a sec if that's all right. Yeah, so we go in winter, um, so uh, you want to be taking quite a lot of layers. It fold at night so if you want to do night driving um, you're going to need to button up against it um, you are in the desert so extremes um, so a winter's day would be 20 25 degrees beautiful um, but if there's wind it will feel chilly um, but at night you're definitely going to want a couple of fleeces and a windproof layer um, and for the morning hat mitts scarf um, but you'll be peeling those off so it's like anything layers are the way forward now, being open year round, I did send some clients out there in January, February last year, um, and it is hot, um, you know, high 30s. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's much, much hotter if you go in the summer months. So spring and autumn um, are often considered, you know, good times. But for us, because our target species really are the nocturnal species, the pangolin, the aardvark, aardwolf, etc., yeah. um, then we think winter is the best time to go. So June, July, August, um, yeah. because they'll be coming out earlier to feed. And that's when we hope to see them. Yeah, okay. And insect life, trouble with mosquitoes? That sort of thing? Uh, in summer, but there will be bugs. Um, yeah, I didn't have any when I went in winter. Um, but in the summer, yes, you are going to get bugs. Um, but in terms of mosquitoes, most of South Africa is malarial free. It's only over on the um, in Kruger on the Mozambique border that they say it's malarial. Um, <laughs> it's always made me laugh that. Do they have screens that says do not pass here they because do. you're entering a <laughs> no mosquito zone? Um, but um, yeah, so you know, you're, yeah, you'll need bug spray. There will be bugs, but there's no malaria in that part of the world. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you. And um, do you get caracal in swallow? You can do. Have you? Did you uh, see? That's, no. no, that's what I, I've, I've only seen one in the wild, and it was a fleeting glimpse as it ran away from me. So when I go back, that's that's what I'll be asking for. <laughs> that's one more than I've seen, Helen. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's another matter. I'll uh, I'll challenge you on that on a on a, on a next <laughs> um, Okay. So so one or two people um, have asked about the possibility of combining um, Swalu with uh, perhaps another country in Africa? What, what about, you know, would it be possible to combine Swalu with Nam Namibia, let's say, or perhaps something in Botswana? Is that sort of thing a possibility? Or would you yeah, say- Yeah, you'd, you'd probably end up going back through Joburg. 
Um, yeah. So, you know, you or do Cape your Swalu. Yeah, um, yes, or to Cape Town. And from Cape Town, you can fly up to Vintook, absolutely, yeah. um, and to Maun, um, or back through Joburg and into Maun yeah. um, or Kasani that way. So, yes, it's absolutely possible to combine. Okay. That's yeah. cool. Thank you very much. Um, and then uh, sort of co coming to the end of the questions that I'm, that, that I'm going to ask you, partly because I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, but someone has said that uh, they would be interested in, did, interested, excuse me, in doing um, self-drive in, in South Africa for a mm -hmm. couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible to bring in um, somewhere like Lekavata into a self-drive itinerary? And then yeah. I guess we should expand that question on a little bit. Would it be possible to include Swalu in a self-drive or, or even both? Right, you cut out a bit there. So is the question, can you include Lekavata? Can you include Swalu? Could you include both? Yes, that is exactly Okay, yeah. yeah. Lekavata, easy peasy, because it is three hours from Cape Town. So yeah. as I said, I spent the day just following the coast so that I could, you know, go to various viewpoints and look for whales along the way and also drink wine at various good wine farms. Um, so uh, obviously not that much because I was driving. Um, but um, so, yeah, it's, it's ridiculously easy to include Lekavata um, from Cape Town. Absolutely. Um, in terms of including Swalu, as I say, um, you can fly, there are shed, if you don't use the private charters that link Swalu with Joburg or Cape Town, you can fly on a scheduled um, SAA link into Uppington. And Uppington is generally the access point for the Trans Kalahari Frontier Park, but it's a four hour drive from their easy drive from there to Swalu. So absolutely, um, you could include that if you're happy to do the driving. And can you include both? Yeah. Um, I mean, from, uh, from the Northern Cape down to Cape Town, um, the trip that I described that includes the wildflowers and so on, um, that's highway all the way again. So if you really wanted to get off the beaten track, from Swalu, come across to the Northern Cape um, and through a place called Springbok. And then you can come down through Namakraland, through Cedarburg, through West Coast National Park, all the way down into Cape Town and then across um, to Lekavata from there. So absolutely, yeah. It's, it, that's quite, quite a lot of driving if you do that, but that's when you often have the best adventures and when you come across things that you weren't expecting. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. I think it's yeah. worth probably me, me um, just saying that when I went to Lekavata, which of course wasn't last year, but it was the year before. In fact, I went a few, a couple of months you after. You went a month after me, yeah, two I months after in, me. I went in August yeah. and the whale watching we had was absolutely unbelievable. Mm -hmm. absolutely. From the deck, from the deck, from your from bed. bed. I mean, crikey. Yeah. 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 Just, it's a phenomenal just, property, and it's just the fact that there is nobody else there. If you go to Hermanus, I, I love Hermanus. Hermanus is brilliant. You can sit in a restaurant and you can look at the whales out yeah. on the bay. You can stand on a cliff and look down. But when you're seeing whales and no other sign of human activity, and they're really close to shore, you can stand on the beach and look at them. Phenomenal. When, yeah. we, when we went there, so um, we were talking to the guide as we were going down, you know, driving from where we parked the car to, to yeah. go down, um, to the lodge. Uh, we sort of said, look, you know, what are the chance of seeing southern right whales? Really, really keen to see them, having seen northern right whales and so on, and wanted to see the southern right whales. Uh, yeah. And they said, well, all you need to do is lie on your bed and look between your toes. And we sort of thought, no, that's oh. And they were spot on. They were spot on. We had, there was oh. rarely a moment when the whales weren't in view on the two days that we were there. Wow, but also just on the hills behind the lodge, actually, one thing I didn't mention there no is that there. there's, there's, no, there's no whales on the hills, but there's Eland, there's Blesbok, yeah. there's Ostrich, um, and that's presumably what the leopard that we, or the leopards that we tracked on the beach, that, you know, they've got to feed on something, so there's antelope um, in De Hoort Nature Reserve as well. So you look yeah. behind you and in front of you, yeah. And 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 for birders, um, I'm pretty sure I'm I can. Well, I know that from a birding point of view, it's fantastic in the woodland at the back there. Uh, mm. But black harrier uh, is something that I particularly wanted to see. In fact, I I was unlucky. I just missed it. But um, uh, it's a great spot for birding too. There's there's no mm. doubt about that. Yeah. Um. Look, so Helen, may I trouble you to put on that last 
um, that last you may. Slide, the very one, the very last slide. There we are. Um, that one which um, which has got the Zoom code, um, not the Zoom code, the um, uh, the discount code on it, um, and uh, um, and and also information about the brochure for anybody that doesn't yet have a copy of our brochure. Um, so look, for those of you that are unfamiliar with what happens next, I will send you all an email um, uh, with my email address on it and with lovely Helen's email address on it. Um, and you're very, very welcome to make contact with us. I'm just going to tell you very briefly, I'm just going to look over at my other screen over here uh, and move something across in front of me. Um, please do sign up to our online presentations. We have a smorgasbord of uh, presentations for you um, from Canada, which is next week, and Discovering Big Cats of the World next week, through to Dartmoor with Nick Baker, the Scottish Highlands and Somerset levels with Mike Dilger. We've got Zimbabwe coming up, Madagascar coming up, and a whole bunch of others. Please go onto our website and have a look. Um, and, and sign up to our e-news because of this new South African trip that we yeah, have good, in the offing. Good point, good point, good point. Um, my, my closing comment is actually going to be a quote um, from Peter who put a note on chat. Um, five minutes ago, saying even the 366 days in a, year, in a leap year won't be enough to fit everything in. What an amazing presentation, Helen, totally inspired. Uh, oh. I couldn't agree with him more. Um, Thanks, Peter. I'm going to raise a glass of South African wine to you right now. <laughs> Um, thanks ever so much, Helen. Thank you, everybody, for being on board this evening. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. It's always lovely hearing uh, Helen's drive and enthusiasm talking about these places. And um, we'll see you again soon. All the best. <laughs>